Hi guys, welcome to Emancipated Human. My name is Luis. Today I have one of my inspiring heroes today. One of the guys that I work with at the Libertarian Party. I'm a delegate there too and uh, he welcomed me with open arms. John Spivey. He has uh, quite a cool career and um, you'll see why I find him pretty interesting and inspiring. Um, we we're going to talk a little bit about politics, why he turned into libertarianism, uh, health, and amongst other cool things. So uh, I promise this is going to be pretty interesting. So, uh, John, uh, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. How, how did you, uh, two-part question, what made you become a libertarian? What, what, what background do you have? And uh, from there, we ask you, like, what made you, um, what inspired you to take action and get into the politics, into the belly of the beast, and try to make change? Well, um, and first of all, hey, thank you very much for having me on. It's one of these things that, um, you know, I, I don't know why. I guess I'm, I'm happy that you find me an inspiring person, but I'm just, you know, I always just think of myself, I'm just a kind of a regular guy, and you talk about, you know, what is my background? Um, I didn't particularly have a you know a poli sci degree or anything like that. I took you know I took history and and uh, uh, you know social studies type courses throughout high school and, and college. But um, you know I didn't really see that as a career for myself. But um, even I, I guess it all started as as a as a child. Um, I would see um, documentaries on TV and old footage of World War II, and I would see a lot of. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the aftermath of what I could recognize then as too much government whenever, um, you know, I, I'd see these horrifying images of, you know, bodies being pushed into a mass grave, you know, outside of uh, Auschwitz or something, you know, and it just, as a child, that resonated with me. And I remember I grew up in the in the middle of, of the Cold War, and um, um, while there was a lot of rah-rah nationalism going on at the time, the one thing that sounded completely unfair to me was, you know, we were fighting this this monster called communism out there. And um, the thing that struck me as completely unfair about communism was apparently in communism, uh, they almost dictated what your job would be. Uh, they would take, they saw labor as a resource of the community, not something that you had personally, but something that the community could exploit, and somehow these you know people in, uh, in charge and a kind of a central control would basically place these people's labor where they saw fit, not where the individual made a, a decision on that. And that freaked me out as a little kid. I thought that was completely. I just I uh, it it scared me to think that somebody else was going to be making my career decisions for me. You know, damn it, I want to be a football player, and they're not going to tell me I can't be. So. Um, uh, you know that's that's you know going way far back, but I saw at the time you know what the what the problems of having too much government was, and then um, I think it's pretty cool how you you were able to present that because they talk about exploiting the workers, but in reality, under communism, we are the ones being exploited because absolutely. of the placement and the yeah. lack of free will. That that's a good point. And that's, uh, yeah, and it is interesting that, yeah, they do, uh, you know, they do cite themselves as champions of the people, champions of the worker, and uh, it's, it's absolutely true. What they're doing is they are exploiting the worker uh, for the common good, and, uh, you know, and as I learned later, there is no such thing as group happiness. You know, they can only extract individual happiness to try to, you know, again, place those resources to the so-called common good. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 I saw the problems with that. And then growing on up, uh, as I got uh, uh, a little older in my teen years, I kind of thought of myself that I was this kind of, you know, possibly a, a liberal Democrat because I felt um, that people should be able to live their life. I, I disagreed with, uh, you know, a lot of our, our war efforts in the past. You know, I saw, you know, what Vietnam did, and um, uh, I... I really had a problem with that, so I was kind of an anti-war guy, um, and uh, um, you know, I I saw that um, uh, again. Uh, I, I was for kind of the civil rights notion I had in my head. I thought all people should be treated equally and fairly, and and uh, so for a while I kind of was thinking I might be a Democrat, but uh, 
then at some point later in, in my high school years, I thought this doesn't, you know, this doesn't balance out. I've got, um, you know, this notion that too much government causes destruction and uh, death and, and, and suffering. And uh, yet I'm for people being treated with respect and equally, and I'm, I'm against war. Uh, but in order to do that, the left is telling me we need more government. And so <laughs> it was just, you know, my head kind of exploded for a while. And then, um, you know, it was about in college. Um, I saw, you know, and again, uh, libertarians will, you know, kind of laugh at me now. But I saw Ronald Reagan saying things like, you know, government isn't the solution. Government is a problem. And that resonated with me. So, um you know, without doing a ton of research, but just liking those talking points, you know, I kind of hopped into the Republican fray um, in college and, you know, kind of did volunteer work for the Reagan campaign number two. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so uh, kind of, you know, in retrospect, uh, I, I see, yeah. you know, that that wasn't completely congruent with my libertarian beliefs as they became more fleshed out. So, um, and then about George W, uh, George H W Bush time with his, um, promise of no new taxes. And then we got new taxes and, uh, amongst many other things, I kind of just became disillusioned with, um, you know, really major politics. So, um, you know, or I should say major party politics, but I was still again, very interested in politics. So, um, anyhow, a little bit later, I kind of moved into the, uh, uh, the libertarian world. So, um, wasn't even sure that, you know, at the time that there was a libertarian party until, you know, about a dozen years ago. So we're just curious where, you know, and, and I've enjoyed doing, um, you know, activism with you and, uh, and you, you've been relatively new to the Tarrant County. I'm losing you. Party, I'd say, you know, you know, how did you come into it? Just curious. Uh, uh, quite honestly, I just want to change. And like, I guess, um, how did I find Libertarian Party in Tarrant County? Is that what you're asking me? Or, or just, yeah. Or, you know, how did you find like the Libertarian Party maybe in general and then us individually? Well, Ron Paul. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I actually... Um, when I came to the United States, you know, I became a legal resident. And then after, you know, like everybody else in the world knows that the U.S. government is crap. So, like, I had no desire to be a U.S. citizen or more like a, a U.S. subject. Mm -hmm. But um, a after the uh, Ron Paul campaign in 08 and then uh, in 12, I was like, well, I, I just kind of have to do something. So I, I became a citizen. And to be able to work from within and try to do some change. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, in the meantime, I, uh, the whole notion, like I stopped eating meat because of a, a ideology of, um, you know, non-aggression principle, um, peaceful and all that, um, ahimsa, as the Hindus call it. Uh, so I was like, well, I, I mean, I, I have to do something about this. So I went on like the internet and I looked you up on Meetup. I mean, the Libertarian Party, I was like, meet up Libertarian Party, uh, internet, and then I found you guys, and I asked to see if I could join, and um, Alan Patterson, the chair, he, um, you know, it took a while, I was like, this, uh, maybe, I don't know, I mean, like, I was kind of weary, because it took, like, a whole month for me to be accepted, but, I mean, I know <laughs> now that, it, like, it, it takes a while, because we're so busy with so many things, but, um, so th that's how I got a hold of you guys. Well, I'm glad you did, and and you've been a, a fantastic addition to, you know, our our uh, team of activists. And um, yeah, it was uh, uh, now for me uh, locally. And it's funny, and I know that probably some of the people that are wa watching this are, you know, uh, anarchists, uh, anarcho-capitalists, voluntarists, and and which is I a thousand percent, you know, support. Kind of, you know what they're all about, and I want to live in that voluntarist world. Um, my thought is, though, is without some kind of uh, gigantic revolution or without some kind of you know giant uh, uh, change that's going to happen quickly, I don't see that world 
you know, happening, and a lot of people kind of deride me sometimes as being an incrementalist because I, you know, I'm okay with kind of these, some of these baby steps and working within the system. But, you know, again, unless there's some kind of a, you know, huge uh, revolution, I, I don't know that, um, you know, that's the way I saw that, it's, uh, that we're going to do this. Um, you know, there are two ways to change the system. And the system right now is like this giant aircraft carrier. So um, you can either work within, you know, the aircraft carrier trying to get it to change its course. And by the way, that's really difficult to do. You know, aircraft carriers take a long time to kind of change their course. And on, you know, while you're on the boat, you're having to fight through people who are guarding the bridge who won't let you on. And um, so, you know, that's a really difficult, you know, battle. But, um, you know, and maybe a, a better analogy might be a super tanker. Uh, right now, we can see that, uh, you know, in you know, certain seas in the, in, you know, off the coast of Africa, guys in ski boats right now can basically change the course of giant super tankers because, you know, they're having such problems with, you know, um, piracy and terrorism and stuff. But what I'm thinking is, you know, again, not uh, initiating aggression here. But I see us as being able, because they're afraid of us, to change the course of that giant super tanker with me and my little ski boat. You know, we're a much more agile, um, you know, an, an agile community out here. We're able to work together a lot more easily, change our course more easily. But because of the fear that they have in this super tanker, we're able to get it to change its course. So one way or another, the goal is to get this gigantic behemoth to change its course. And I just saw it as easier to do in my little ski boat than trying to battle through the, the people guarding the bridge on the ship. So, you know, that's my analogy on, on that. Um, I love your analogy, and I, I am an anarchist, as you know, and I agree with everything that you say, and I think that life is not linear. It's systems thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, I see it as the faces of a diamond, you know, like, yeah, I work on this side with the voluntary interactions, planting seeds, because, you know, I am not going to see results in my lifetime. Maybe my kids won't, mm -hmm. but hopefully their kids, you know, so it's a process that's going to be extremely lengthy, as you said. But at the same time, I think that it will be um, lack of foresight or wishful thinking not to want to get into the belly of the beast and do something about it. And that's why I'm you know, I wanted to join your team oh. uh, to be able to make change in several places at once instead of putting <clears throat> all our eggs in one basket. So, yeah, I'm doing, you know, the activism. I'm doing, um, like, teaching about uh, liberty. And we're also doing this stuff with the Libertarian Party, amongst other things, you know, like commerce in, on, on its own, like mm -hmm. just our daily interactions with other people, uh, planting seeds with them. That's pretty powerful, too. So I, I think um, what you do, what we do, is really important with the little jet ski uh, analogy. And, I mean, I, I just totally agree with it. So, Well, it was – and by the way, I, we've made – I think we've made tremendous strides in just the past decade or so. And, again, it was about um, – oh, gosh, I, I can't remember exactly, 2002 – that's whenever I started hearing about the fact that there was a Libertarian Party. And then in 2004, I went to my first you know, county convention. And for those of you who don't know how we do things, at least in Texas, um, you know, we have either um, – uh, and actually at this point, I believe we may have an option of if we want to be a primary party or a convention party. Or it, we kind of do things like the Iowa caucuses, for example – and uh, instead of having these big, expensive, taxpayer-funded primaries, uh, what we do is we have these series of uh, conventions. And we start off small with a precinct uh, convention and a county convention and a district convention and then a state convention. And uh, in 2004, I went to my first county convention, and um, I was excited at first to go to it. And I didn't know where we were going, and then I realized I was going, you know, when I, I got the address... I thought this kind of sounds like a like a residential address, but anyhow, <laughs> I went to it, and sure enough, it was like in this guy's you know little house, and you know, thankfully, you know, uh, our, our our chair, state chair Pat Dixon, had um, 
you know, hurriedly, uh, you know, blessed this guy as the uh, interim county chair just so we could have a convention. Uh, just realized that the, the election prior to this, we were off the ballot. Uh, we didn't have a single candidate. We were legally barred from being on the ballot because our vote totals didn't, you know, didn't permit us to be on. We literally had to go through, and this was right before my time, we had to get 45,000 signatures and uh, present that uh, to the um, Secretary of State to get back on the ballot. You know, through those Herculean efforts, we got back on the ballot, and uh, I went to my first convention, and again, it it was in this guy's house, and there were four of us in this convention, and I was like, hey, you know, Tarrant County has, you know, almost 800,000 registered voters. Um, I think we can do better than four people in a convention. Again, I know this is kind of, you know, version 2.0, we just kind of restarted, but I was, I was, you know, excited about the prospects, but disappointed with the, you know, with what was happening. And I thought in the next, you know, if, if nothing happens between now and the next county convention, and there, nothing gets built, um, I'm going to ask to be nominated for chair, and then we're going to like have a real life party. We're going to have a, I mean, a real life political party and maybe actual party too. So <laughs> the next election uh, cycle came and um, there were about six or seven people at that convention, which again sucked. So I was like, I'd like to, you know, please nominate me. And um, I got nominated as chair. And um, so we started doing things like using, you know, social media meetup at the time is really all we had and getting a, uh, getting a, um, uh, uh, you know, an online presence and uh, started going out and actively recruiting people and candidates and stuff. And so, you know, now, uh, you know, our meetup group has, you know, I don't even know, uh, a couple of two or three hundred people. A lot of them show up, uh, you know, we have really nice events and a great core of activists now. We have In Texas, we have a slate of 132 candidates, uh, which uh, is, by the way, the most in, a, in America. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty exciting. And now we're seeing things, for example, like I think that because of this, we're changing the, the, the prevailing thoughts on things like, um, you know, gay marriage. And again, most libertarians poo-poo the fact that that we should not have to petition the government to have them bless our relationships. But, um, you know, again, I see it as kind of an incremental step um, of uh, making sure that everybody at least has, um, you know, so-called equal protection under the law. Um, uh, And just really equality for all people and their relationships like that. And also, um, another kind of a big issue that I like to fight for is, um, uh, for, you know, legalization of, of marijuana, for example. We've been throwing people in, in cages forever for basically owning something, owning a substance. Um, just by owning that, it doesn't harm anybody else. And uh, yet, uh, here we are, um, I would say, you know, eight years ago, it would have been unheard of to to think that we could be legalizing marijuana. And now in Texas, Polls are showing that public perception has shifted, and because of that, politicians they take they take notice of that. So um, I think that here before too long we're going to see, you know, legalization of uh, of marijuana. I'm, I'm excited about that that prospect. Prohibition so. doesn't work. Never. Yeah. I mean, it's never. not like people are not buying it as is. No. Uh, that's funny. I just I I just started watching. Um, uh, I'm starting to binge watch uh, the um, Boardwalk Empire, and uh, it's about the early days of uh, you know the prohibition of alcohol, and it's uh, exactly what we're seeing with you know what's happened with the uh, you know prohibition of, of any and all drugs. It's, it basically leads to this uh, you know organized uh, criminal empires and uh, exploitation of people. Uh, the government tramples on everybody's rights, and uh, you know so. Hey, we we saw this happen once before. We know it doesn't work, and man, we have been beating this dead horse for a long time. So people are people are catching on to that, and it's because of I think uh, of what we're doing. So I I'd like to think that. So, yeah, uh, I totally agree, and I think like one of the main things why I wanted your voice here is because the hard work, starting with one person, has 
done a chain reaction that has inspired many and brought many on board to your vision. And uh, I like the practical examples, and this is a really powerful one. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, um, uh, I, this all started as a, um, uh, a New Year's resolution, actually, and uh, a lot of people say New Year's resolutions don't work, but, you know, hey, this one worked for me, and really what I, I, I wanted to do was to um, uh, manage what I knew as a sugar addiction and a, and a, and a, a grain addiction that I had, and uh, I mean, it was one of those, you know, just realizing you had that problem is you know most of the problem so uh, what I decided to do is to to start this paleo lithic nutrition eating regimen where you know I'm, I'm trying to eat more clean um, I do still eat meat but nothing fried uh, no sandwiches uh, I eat like a, a, a caveman would um, if you think about it we've only been farming for about the past you know eight nine thousand years or so but we've spent, you know, tens of thousands of years before that as hunters and gatherers. So uh, ultimately, if you look at what our bodies have been supposed to, you know, what we're evolving into, you know, we've only had a short period of time where we've been eating grains. And um, so I think that, you know, it really paid off for me to eat uh, things effectively that you don't need fire uh, to, to cook, although I do use, you know, I heat it, but uh, don't necessarily have to. So I do eat, I eat meats and I eat veggies uh, six days a week, uh, five small meals a day. Um, five small meals a day? Yeah, and each meal consists of, uh, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do is get a fist-sized portion of protein and a fist-sized portion of, uh, you know, good carbs, you know, vegetables, um, uh, salad, whatever, I eat fruits and um, so, and then I drink a, a, a lot of water throughout the day, but then one day a week, and this was this is my addiction management stuff. One day a week, I um, I just eat whatever I damn well please, and I I, I eat donuts and and <laughs> I eat you know Tex Mex and I just I go off the rails and I drink beer. That's another thing is like I don't have any alcohol throughout the week, and that's uh, you know it used to be every every activism event I did, it was like you know let's be sure and go to a place that has beer. Of you know it was. So uh, it still is that way, but uh, you know, uh, only on Saturdays will I have the beer. But anyhow, by ad adhering to that eating regimen, you know, fairly, you know, fairly rigidly, and uh, ramping up my exercise, and I put like goals. Like at the end of one year, I wanted to run a half marathon, and I accomplished that. And then the next, you know, this year is to run a marathon. So you know, it's not like outlandish. Like a two-year ramp up to run a marathon is extremely doable. So. Um, and, you know, to me, too, and maybe a lot of other people, having a goal like that will help you to actually stay on a plan to achieve that goal. So, um, anyhow, I, it's, it's been good for me, and, and my health has, you know, really improved uh, quite a bit because of it. So That's another important example that, like, it does not matter where you are, you can always start. And, yeah. like, you've, you've gotten great results, and that's, that's also pretty inspiring. And, like... Something that you mentioned that I thought was a very good point. You know, we are on this sedentary lifestyle and we just eat all this crap and like we don't do a lot of exercise, but you know, we don't really see the pounds accumulating. Mm -hmm. And one day we wake up and you're like, what the hell? Yeah. I need change. And, and you see when you look in photographs, because you look in the mirror all the time and that's been this gradual thing. So the mirror doesn't really, you know, tell you the truth. But sometimes whenever you see a photograph, it's like, who is this person? You know, how did how did I get to be that person? And that's kind of another thing. I kept seeing pictures of me, and I was like, "I'm oh, a complete fat ass. I can't believe I let myself get this way." So, uh, yeah, that's important. Um, thank you. I, um, you know, I, something similar happened to me. So I'm. I see you as an inspiration. I started, you know, biking and just going on walks during my lunch Good. break. Awesome. Um, I was like, well, you know, that guy's doing it and he's getting good results. So, uh, you know, it's hot, it's whatever, but I go out and like I come all sweaty and just change. Sure. So, you know, we have a shower at work. So if I'm really nasty, I just rinse <laughs> off real quick. But uh, yeah. I think it's, um, 
a good idea to just also, you know, because of the whole libertarian thing is changing from within. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I be a better person? And like, that also includes diet, includes health. Um, uh, Ram Dass was saying that the best gift you can give to anybody is yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can we do that? You know, um, yeah, I mean, libertarianism and anarchy is uh, individualistic ideology, but that does not mean that we don't give. That That's completely the opposite. Like, the best, the most successful people are those who serve the most. Mm -hmm. So how can we be in better shape? How can we be in uh, good terms with ourselves, our image, how we like to be, how we like to feel, to be able to accomplish more stuff outside as well? Mm -hmm. So I think you've done that really amazingly, and that's why I wanted to also uh, put this out there. You know, yeah. it's one. It's one of those things, and I, I hear this analogy, and I, I love this, uh, and you may have heard this, but uh, whenever you're on an airplane and they give you the safety uh, spiel, um, they tell you that you know should they lose pressure, the oxygen masks home down, and if you're with somebody that needs help, put yours on first so you can help the people that are next to you, and that's one thing. Is like I feel that you know if I'm in terrible health, I won't be able to. You know, I'll have a shorter time on on this earth to help other people, and um, so and quality of life. Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, I'll I be, bet you're sleeping better now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I still don't ever sleep a whole lot, but I do sleep better. I've just never slept a whole lot. Um, so that's something I need to work on, though. Um, but uh, yeah, and that's also another thing. Like I kind of I've stepped down a little bit from all the activism to focus on my work in the private sector. And ultimately what I see is this, is that whenever I'm retired and I've got a nice bank, you know, that's whenever I can concentrate on, you know, maybe running for office or contributing more or being, you know, being able to spend time more freely. So again, I'm trying to take my, take care of myself financially and get completely debt free, getting close. And, uh, just uh, trying to, um, uh, you know, be in a good spot later where I can help for the longest time. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to do there too. Exactly. Because, you know, this kind of work does take a lot of time away from family and it takes a lot of money. Mm. You know, like you said, conventions here and there and then like yep. um, supporting this candidate and, you know, like, I mean, it's $10 here, $20 there. Mm -hmm. But it, it adds up and your time sure. and like stuff, you know, sometimes taking off from work to be able to do this kind of work. So it is pretty um, honorable work, and, and, but it's important to put ourselves first and yeah. foremost, you know. So, yeah. Um, any last thoughts you would like to tell us here uh, before we close the shop? Oh, I, I guess that's it. I mean, ultimately, everything I do, every acid test that I... I uh, apply to any kind of uh, policy or law or thought is uh, the fact that, hey, I own myself, I think you own yourself, and as owners of ourself and the stuff that we accumulate through honest trade, we should be able to do with our, ourselves and our stuff as we see fit without the interference of government as long as we don't infringe upon other people's rights. I just take that statement and apply it to try to anything. And, uh, you know, anything that there is out there from, you know, any political discussion I have to, you know, any ethical question I might have. And uh, if it passes that test, then I know that it's it's the right thing to do. So, you know, I would just tell people, hey, consider that that thought as you're as you're, you know, talking about politics or thinking about politics next time. And, um, you know, that's the acid test that I always give. And I, I give that little stump speech about you know, every single opportunity I can because uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's doing that. Yes, and that's yeah. that's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, like the way I like to say it is our parents, or at least most people were taught that, you know, don't start shit, but don't take, you know, yeah. <laughs> don't take it either, you know. So, like, everybody minds their own business, but don't initiate anything. Wow. Right. Self-defense is a different story. Right. But that's kind of our ideology, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's why our, um, our, our mascot is the porcupine. Hey, we're a sweet little cuddly, wonderful animal. But, uh, you know, if you rub it the wrong way, you know, you're going to, you're going to get uh, a handful of uh, quills and it's not, it's very painful. So uh, <laughs> yeah. when we voluntarily interact with you, it's great, but otherwise watch out. Exactly. So. <laughs> that's what we're doing. So 
Yeah. Thank you so much. All I right. have uh, John Spivey here with me again, and uh, check him out. He's on Facebook. Uh, we can probably put your link down here for your okay. Facebook friendship. Maybe they can follow you, whatever. Uh, sure. Pretty cool guy, pretty inspiring guy. So thank you so much, and right. peace, love, and anarchy. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you soon.